and welcome to Expedition Church midweek service. So glad to have you tonight. Jesus is Lord. And once again, I did it. Had all that extra time and still didn't turn this thing off. We were too busy having fun. Hallelujah. <coughs> um, we don't want to rub it in, but if you missed this past Sunday at Expedition Church, you missed it. Oh, my. Did we have a good time? We had a good, everything was perfect. The food was great. The fellowship was great. And um, quite honestly, guys, I was just, I was happy um, as much about the cleanup as I was about everything else. And here's why. Because everybody was working and cleaning and, and, and straightening up, and they were all fellowshipping while they were doing it. It wasn't, well, we got to get this done and get out of here and the pressure. Everybody was just kind of like in this <coughs> whistle while you work mode. <laughs> it, was, it was cool. It was cool just to see everybody. You know, we were all just so relaxed. You know what? There wasn't any of the got to get out of here, the Girl Scouts are coming and got to get out of here. The church has to close up because we're not this isn't our church. Um, you know, everybody's tired of being at the business park because, you know, there's nowhere for the kids to play. It was start to finish the best fellowship we've ever had. And um, now that's not the end of it. That was that was the beginning. And uh, but it was it was just it was a blessing to me to see everybody have so much fun, enjoy the fellowship. Everything come off so perfect. And um, the only thing I wish we had done on Sunday is we carried the Pleasant Garden Fire Department their lunch. I wish I had known. Uh, we, we had enough. I, I, I should have called them and said, how many guys y'all got down there? And went down there and fed them. Cause, and that's, that's the kind of stuff we're going to start doing. You know, we just want them to go, hey, hey that, that church down there, they're cool. They fed us. You know, uh, we were just down, we were down here getting pot pies and whatever. And here comes fried chicken and barbecue. So that that's coming. Hallelujah. Next year is going to be a, another a different year. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Um, all right. Let's uh, we're going to we're going to go ahead. Hey, <laughs> we were just talking a little bit about in-house business, but let's go on and um, we'll move into. Um, oh, we're going to wrap up, you know, I, I hope. Uh, the, the miracles or the, or the healings in the ministry of Jesus. And um, we, we talked about last week the deaf and dumb man. But then we want to also talk about the blind man, man near Bethsaida over in Mark's gospel, the 22nd verse. Uh, well, the eight, I believe the 8th chapter in the 22nd verse. Uh, Mark 8. Everybody say Mark 8. What did Mark eat? Well, if he was here Sunday, he ate barbecue. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, Mark Webbine was, uh, should have come down here with Kathy and get, could have gotten some of that, but they didn't. <clears throat> okay. Um, Mark 8, 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring him a blind man, and he besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him, and he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. In other words, it, was, it, it wasn't clear. It, it, he saw something, but it wasn't clear. And he put his hands upon him again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly and sent him his way to his house, saying, neither go to town nor tell it to anyone that is in town. Um, here we have, you don't go out and start a spitting ministry because Jesus spit in this guy's eyes. Again, we have to learn to follow the Holy Ghost. And one of the most important things we'll learn as believers in walking with God is that we can copy, or not copy, that's not really a good word. We can follow somebody else's faith, but you can't follow somebody else's how. Because it's not always the same. And the Spirit of God may speak to someone to spit in their eyes. They may tell somebody else to slap them. They may tell somebody else to breathe on them. Okay? Because somebody else did it, you can't run out and grab the Scripture. He's not a respecter person. So he'll do it for them. He'll do it for me. And you run out and do it. It doesn't work that way. 
They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So this is not a doctrine of the church that you can spit in people's eyes and they get healed. This is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit giving instruction on what to do. Um, I'm reminded um, in that of Brother Hagin's story he used to tell about the oil guy. And uh, he was, you know, he was from the black lands of Texas. Okay. Yeah, he, he's from the black lands of Texas now. And that, that's almost like holy ground to, to a Texan. And, um, <clears throat> uh, the, you know, they were in a church service and this, this oil man was there and, um, God spoke to him by the Holy Ghost. He said, <clears throat> uh, cause he was, he wasn't striking oil. He said, I want you to go, I want you to drill here and I want you to drill at a 45 degree angle. Okay, so he goes out to his, 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 his rigger, tells the guy, says, look, I need for you to drill here. I need for you to drill it at a 45 degree angle. And the guy goes, wait, 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 boss. No, 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 you don't understand. Goes and gets all the geological, lays them out and says, look, there's no oil there. He said, I'm the boss. I'm paying you. You go over here and drill, and you drill at a 45 degree angle. Well, they struck oil. Well, God speaks to the man again, says, now, go over here and do this, and did the same thing. And the guy again pulls out all the geological, says, look, there's no oil there. After about the third or fourth time, he threw him away and said, what do you want to drill next? Because they kept striking oil. Well, he gives his testimony in church. And there's another oil guy in there. And so he goes, well, he's not a respected person. He did it for him and do it for me. And he went out there and went bankrupt. <clears throat> Why? <coughs> it wasn't the method that you can copy. Hello? Of drilling at a 45 degree angle on some non supposed spot. It was the faith you can follow in obeying God's voice. You see, had he obeyed God's voice, prayed and got answers from God and did what God told him to do, he could follow that faith. But you can't follow the method. <clears throat> Hello. Um, Jesse even posted something yesterday, just a little bit that I, I read. And I thought, yeah, because she's heard me talk about this before. Um, how many people on planet Earth tried to copy Paul Yonge's chose um, cell group method? <clears throat> Not anybody, no one, no one, no one has come close to the success he had with it. Nobody. Um, nobody we know of on planet earth has a church of 800,000 to a million people. They do six services, 15,000 people a service. They're in and out in 15 minutes and start the next one. Well, there are a number of reasons. One is the culture is more following than it is leading. You're not as many as, you know, not as many as people who, who lead as they do follow. Very more submissive type culture than it is aggressive leading culture. Okay? Um, problem in America, and it happened here. They're talking about your Koreans, you know, your people. <laughs> huh? Not your mom. Okay. But the culture overall, okay, and, and that was in Seoul, South Korea. He, and they have 90,000 people praying 24 hours a day up on Prayer Mountain. Okay? And they, the leaders were extremely submissive. They would have the cell groups because he couldn't pastor a million people. So all the cell pastors would come in. He would teach them what they were going to teach the people. And it worked great. As obviously the success of it has just been unmeasured anywhere else. What happened when we did it in America? Well, what you would think happens in America. Somebody get about 10, 15 people coming to their cell group. I know more than the pastor. Time for me to start a church. And go out and split the church and start a church. All the time. Now, what could you follow in that? His faith. His obedience to the voice of God on how to do it. This is where I, I come cross grains a lot of times with a lot of leadership teaching. <clears throat> because a lot of stuff is cookie cutter stuff. Hello. And usually it's people with big churches that are teaching everybody else how to do it. 
but how did you get big? Hello? Did you do it because you obey God or did you do it because you followed somebody's plan? And did you get big because it was God or did you get big because you manipulated the circumstances? Okay? Are you following after God? Because the question is always going to be to me, are you obeying God? Because if you're obeying God, it doesn't matter if you've got 30 or 30,000. 30, if you're in obedience to God to what you're doing, then you're doing what you're supposed to do. Amen. Now, I can't tell you how many people told me and said, and we heard back from people that, you know, um, I'm basically insane because we kept doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Whose narrative, who's, who's definition of insanity? The world's. That's not a church definition. That's the world's definition. And so we kept doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, not getting a different result. And so, and I had, I had somebody sit in my office and tell me, you know, the definition of insanity is, well, thank you for your support. You know, um, they're going to go find something big, something exciting, you know. And, and I've seen too many people who've built their churches by plundering other churches and building it off of other churches and, you know, pa pastors getting connected to a certain name and using that name. And when they can't use that anymore to get bigger, they change to a bigger name. I outgrew them. Gaga maggot. You outgrew them my foot. And when this one pastor in particular, I know, and I know the person he outgrew and I doubt it because the man he outgrew is, is solid, strong, deep, wise, mature, but he went after a big name, television name ministry that was bigger. Hello. You could drop that name and get more people. Okay. So all that to say, now let's come back to the healing. So following the, being led by the spirit, when we're ministering to people, you better not be spitting in somebody's eyes. If God don't tell you, you probably gonna get slapped. Maybe not by the person because they're blind, but somebody around the room. <clears throat> okay. And so notice the first thing he did was he let him out of town. Why do you think he did that? Anybody have any idea why Jesus may have led him out of town before he ministered to him? How about unbelief? Was there enough? Um, was there so much unbelief in that area he couldn't even minister? You know, you could be God can, God can um, speak to you, say, do this, and He knows that the, sur the surrounding people, their unbelief is going to short circuit what's going on. And He saw saw them as as you know, trees walking. So his, his vision was, was whatever, and he laid hands on him again. What, what, now, what's going on here? I heard Mark Brzee say this one time. You know, if you've got a 100% anointing, you get healed. If there's a 100% faith, you get healed. Any combination of the two to 100%. So if you got 50% anointing, 50% faith, you get 100%. <clears throat> if there's 20% faith, but 80% anointing, sometimes you can minister to people and there's only 20% faith and, um, you know, 60% anointing, but it pulls their faith up. So the second time he obviously reached up and got higher. Okay. But if you've got unbelief around you, you got to get away from the unbelief. It'll rob you. It'll pull you down. The naysayers will pull you down. Just like that girl I was going to minister to one night um, about being filled with the Holy Ghost. God, God anointed me to lay hands on people and then being filled with the Holy Spirit. And she freaked out because she'd been in church. The pastor said, if anybody ever says that, run. They're of the devil. And I'm thinking, how in the world could you come up with that? Hello? 
Like Brother Hagin said, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. Everybody else up there got filled with the Holy Ghost. Except freak out girl. Ah, freak out. She didn't get anything. Hello? All right. So we have here where he ministered to them by the direction of the Spirit that spit in his eyes. If you're going to hop to it, you better know that you heard from heaven. What if I don't know? Then don't do it. You learn the voice of God so you're clear and you know that you know when, you do, when you're doing things. Amen? Okay, let's, let's look at John 9 here. Oh, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna jump right in here, both feet right into something. All right? John 9, pretty much the chapter. Okay? Come on. Get over here. All right. When Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was born blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him and saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now what? Because the Jews believed if you were born blind, there had been sin. Either in the, either the, the child sinned in the womb or the parents sinned. That was, a, that, was a, that was a cultural belief. There's no basis for it. They just believe that. And he said, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I'm, now, here we have a debate. Because here people use this scripture to say that God made him born blind so that he could work a miracle. Now understand the Greek doesn't have the, the punctuation like we do in English and the structure. Um, really what Jesus said here, so th this is King James punctuation, not Greek. Here's Jesus' answer. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, period. But that the works of God should be made manifest to him, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. He anointed the eyes of the blind with, made with clay. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is being by interpretation sent. He therefore went there, therefore, and washed and came see. Now, he's got this spitting thing going on. Takes it to another level. Now he's going to make mud. And, can you imagine having mud rubbed in your eyes? You already can't see. Now you're getting all that grain and dirt. From, I mean, rubbed in your eyes. Woo! Go wash it in the pool of Siloam. Now, let's stop here for a second. I submit to you that the proper translation or should have been, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, period. However, let's just assume that he was born blind so God could work a miracle. The fact is, if that was why he was born blind, he got healed. If you take that position, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. He, the works of God was to heal him. Even if you take the position that God made this man blind so he could be healed, he got healed. <clears throat> because most naysayers are, we don't know why God did this. We don't understand the reason that Lord did this. He's working something out. I have no idea what it was. Jesus said that the works that God sent him to do was to heal. <clears throat> All right? So there's, there's, there's no question that healing comes from God. And God wants him well, wanted him well. The neighbors, therefore, which had before had seen, uh, seen him that he was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. But he said, I'm he. All right. Therefore they said unto him, How were thine eyes open? He said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said, Go wash. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. 
And they said unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought him to the Pharisees, um, him that aforetime was blind. And it was on the Sabbath day that Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. <sighs> then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. And therefore, some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. They said to the blind man, what sayest thou of him that he opened to thine eyes? Is he a prophet? But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How did he now see? Parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who opened his eyes, we know not. He's of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogues. Therefore the parents said, he's of age, ask him. So then they called again the blind man and said, give God praise. We know this man is a sinner. And he said, "Give I mean, um, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that I was blind, and now I see. <laughs> and then they said to him again, what did he do? Uh, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you do not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? You, will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he'd open mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, he doeth his will, he heareth them. Since the world began, it was not only heard that any man opened his eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they, oh, they just got rebuked by a non-theologically trained peon. He just rebuked them and quoted scripture on them and totally peeved them off. They answered and said, thou wast altogether born in sins and dost thou teach us. And they cast him out. They threw him out of the synagogue. And when Jesus heard they had cast him out, he went and found him. And he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am coming to the world, but that they which see might not see, and they which are might, uh, um, see might be blind. Be blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? He said, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. <laughs> it wasn't a good day for the Pharisees. They're having a really bad day. You had a bad day. I mean, I mean, it was a bad day for the Pharisees. Religious people get mad when God starts working miracles and signs and wonders because it goes against their narrative that God doesn't do that anymore. God doesn't do that anymore. Those things passed away the day the last apostle died. First of all, how do you know the last apostle died? Just asking. Because he said he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or maturing of the saints till we all come in the unity of the faith. I don't think we've reached that. And he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers until we come in the unity of the faith. So guess what? There are still apostles. 
there are still prophets, evangelists, pastors, and the teachers. Amen. So the day last apostle died, argument goes out the window. Oh, that stopped the day we got the canonicity of the scripture. And what an arbitrary timetable. It's like I had to take my kids um, to a, a job club meeting in October and take the Oreo personality test. Oh, yeah. There is, forget the ink blots. We now use Oreos. You think I'm joking. You know, the ink blots, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? And no matter what you see, the psycho babble on the other side of the table, who is educated beyond their intelligence, is going, oh. And they have stuff that they made up that it beats. What do you mean they made? They just make it up. So we're, we're in this room and they're get, taking Oreos. They get three Oreos. How do you eat your Oreo? If you eat it all at one time, this is this. You're aggressive, da 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 da. If you eat one little bite at the time, you're this, 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 and this. If you dip it in milk, you're this. If you open it up and eat the cream out, then you're that. If you open it up and, and to get the cream out and eat the chocolate only, you're this. If you get out the cream and don't eat the cookie part, you're that. Now, let me tell you, my daughter is weird. Because if she had a bag of Oreos, you would go over there. And she would have a ball of the cream. Because she would take it apart and rake all the cream out and just do with that until she got a ball of it. And eat the cookies and then eat the ball of cream. Why? Well, according to the Oreo personality test, so they're telling all these kids, this is your personality type because this is how you eat an Oreo. Well, there was a lot of scientific research. Garbage. They made it up. Some psychobabble psychologists made it up because they think it means this. It's just made up. So I asked, what happens if you eat it all the different ways? And I told somebody, you're schizophrenic. What it, we can cast that out of you. Anybody doesn't like Oreos, we need the devil cast out. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. You just make stuff up to fit whatever happened. How, how did I get over on that? Yeah, the Pharisees. So, oh, because churches don't believe in miracles and the canonized the scriptures are arbitrary. That was just, they just made that up as a reason. And they, took, and they took a passage of scripture, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. For I know in part and I see in part. Talk about from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, chapter 8, uh, chapter uh, 4, down around verse 9. Paul starts in that whole discourse. If you read that, he says, for then I shall know even as I'm known. I want to know, ask how many in this room know God, the things of God, everything about God, the way he knows you. Then it couldn't have been the canonicity of Scripture was, you know, we got the written word, and that's being knowing even as we're known. No, that's not. Paul said, Paul said, even as he was writing, we know in part and we prophesy in part. But then... 
face to face. Let me, I, I'm, I don't want to misquote it because I think I just misquoted it. I want to make sure I say it right. Okay. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 4. <laughs> Not 1 Corinthians 4. 13. 13. Sorry. Excuse me. Verse 8. Charity never fails. Love never fails. Whether they be prophecies, prophecies they'll fall, fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish. What was he talking about? He's talking about the need for the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But then when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Uh, I became a man. I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly. But then... But when's that then? Face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now by this faith, hope, charity, love, these three, but the greatest is love. And they took that, and when they got the canon of Scripture, and started saying it was the canon of Scripture because we don't no longer see through a glass darkly. Oh, yes, you do. You have full revelation of the written word? We study and study and study and study. And the Spirit, our the God, the teacher, reveals things to us and reveals things to us. And there's so much we still haven't learned and understood and more to come. But there is a day coming. Now, I submit to you. Um. Tell you what, let me look it up real quick because I don't, I don't know. I'm, listen, when I kind of go off on these things, I don't always have the scriptures right there on my, because I wasn't studying to go that way. But that's okay. Okay. First John three two. Beloved. Now are we the sons of God. When? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we should be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But then face to face. Amen? So if I go back to 1 Corinthians 13, Amen. I put away childish things, da, 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 da. But then I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I submit to you, it's talking about when we're called away into the presence of God, we'll know even as we're known. Not the canonicity of Scripture. Because he says here, we won't be like him until we see him as he is. And that's talking about when he appears. You see? They just made up the other. There's no support anywhere else in the world. They just looked at that and went, oh, that means we got the canon of Scripture. Now that supports our narrative. God doesn't do any miracles anymore because we have canon of Scripture and we put away childish things. And that is it. That's where they got it from. With no other support. They made it up. We don't have, I have at least something that says that I'll see him and I'll be like him because I'll see him as he is. Which comes a whole lot more in line with what he says, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians than what Dr. Ph.D. said with canonicity. Hello? Think about the Old Testament. They had canon and they still had miracles. The Old Testament scriptures were canon. They were the canon. You know, we've explained where canon came from, you know, before. The full measure. 
I mean, that, that came from the word, the Hebrew word canon for the reeds that were in the Sea of Reeds, Red Sea. They used them as a measuring stick. And it meant full measure. So canon, K-A-N-O-N, transliterated out of Hebrew, becomes the root word for canonicity, the full measure. Okay, we have the full measure of Scripture. Uh, this, this is the Word of God, it's the full measure. Okay, fine. But you cannot stuff that into that narrative of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. When John clearly states, you're not going to see him as he is until he appears. Meaning you won't know him as you are known until that moment. Listen, you'll know him, but you won't know him as you are known by him. There's a difference between knowing God and knowing God like he knows you. Okay. And I'll be honest, I think the rapture is going to be something like this. He's going to appear. We're going to go, oh, that's a and step over. We're going to see him as he is. And we're going, to, we're going to transcend the inhibitions of the flesh and all that. And go, oh, that's it. And step right into glory. Where the corruptible puts on incorruptible, the mortal puts on immortality. We which are alive remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. But we'll meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here we have a debate again about healing on the Sabbath. Woo! This is a hardcore bunch. This man's been blind his whole life. And because Jesus worked a miracle on the Sabbath, they're going to make this man out of center and throw him out of church. Because he got healed on, on Saturday. Because that was the Sabbath. You know these Christians who don't do anything on Sunday because it's the Lord's Day? Um, you're off a day. Were you cutting your grass yesterday? Hello? Because if you were, you were sinning. According to you. Because it's just, you know, you're not going to violate the Sabbath. Then, then stop cutting your grass on Saturday. How far did you travel yesterday? Did you cook? Hello? We can go right on down the line. You know, we get a lot of, of Christians who, you know, I had an argument with a family member not that long ago. We, we well, it was, it was with my mom, and we were going to go wash clothes. We need to wash some clothes. It was Sunday. No, nah, you can't wash the clothes. Why? It's Sunday. So we don't do work. We don't work on Sunday. My God, you'll drive four hundred miles to get food on Sunday, <laughs> or you'll go get takeout and let them sin <laughs> while you eat the fruit of sin. <laughs> well, my mom. Well, I don't care what your mom. Your mama was wrong. She was a good Christian. Well, she was wrong. Could not wash a few clothes on Sunday because it was the Sabbath. Yeah. That's the same bunch that would leave church early on Sundays after Sunday school so we could get to Parker's barbecue before the rest of the crowd got there and get in line and get the food. Help them people who were cooking on Sunday sin. Can't wash the car. I mean, if you out washing the car on Sunday afternoon and they heard that grandma was coming, had to get everything put away before she got there. You're scrambling. Scrambling. Because grandma might see you washing the car. Well, you know, it was yesterday was the Sabbath day. You had me cutting grass. And if grandma had come yesterday, you wouldn't have said a word about it. Because we adopted Sunday as a Sabbath, but it's not. Sunday was not the Sabbath. Never was, never will be. Now it's referred to as the Lord's Day because the day he was raised on a Sunday or on the, on the first day of the week. Okay. But come on. We can let religion rob us 
of the power and the blessings of God. These guys are peeved. This man got healed on a Sunday or Saturday on the Sabbath. And they're going to go have a knockdown, drag out, throw him out of the church, do a full blown. They, listen, they're probably standing by the investigation because they had to walk too far on that day to do the investigation. They're doing a full blown pharisaical investigation of the man who was born blind being healed on, on, on the Sabbath. And they're calling in witnesses and they're testing, they're trying to find out what took place and they're trying to prove that he did something wrong. Because they did it on the Sabbath. You <clears throat> will always make religious devils mad when God does something that brings glory to him and his kingdom. You start a healing revival. You start having signs, wonders, and miracles. And you'll have churches get up in their pulpits and start calling you the cult and of the devil. And they, and, and they don't care. This person was dying of leukemia and they're now healed. They don't care. This person was blind and now they see. Because it goes against their narrative. And they can't be wrong. Like that one preacher, um, dad was staying in his home. You know, they did that back in that day. They, they, didn't, they didn't put him in a hotel. They stayed in the home. The pastors fed them, housed them. They stayed in the home. And... Um, He's preaching, and the man's got some physical problems. And um, he, he tried to talk and said, you know, he's teaching on uh, faith in the mornings. He said, you need to get in these services. Yeah, I know what I just got. I got to go visit the sick. I got to be at the radio station. I got to do this. Had all this stuff he had to do. And uh, so that, you know, after the pastor left and went to go there, he, Brother Hagin turned to the man's wife and said, he needs to be in these services. He needs to hear what I'm saying. She says, yeah, I know, Brother Hagin, I've been telling him. I've been telling him he needs to get in there and hear this. And so one more time, she said, why don't you try to talk? She said, I've talked to him several times. She said, why don't you try again? And so uh, he got him a couple of days later, got him and said, listen, you need to come in there and listen to what I had to say. He said, I know it. And um, she said, then why don't you come? Actually, brother, he, he, he started giving him excuses. And Brother Hagin got frustrated and said, don't you know you're going to die? See, he'd already seen in the spirit. If he didn't make a change, he's going to die. And the man went, yeah, I know it. But for me to come, it had to be, I'd have to admit you were right and I was wrong. I'd rather die than do that. He said, he clo I closed the service down right then. Went to the next church because he always had a line of people said, he didn't have a date. He said, I'll get to you when I'm ne next. I'll call you when you're next. That's how he meant it. Because he might be at a church, church two, three, four weeks, five weeks, whatever. And uh, he couldn't set a date. And he wasn't going to tie the Holy Ghost down. And when that service, those services, and he called, hey, I'm ready to come. They say, come on. Now we got church services planned out three years in advance. If God would have a move like that, we'd have to mess up people's calendars for three years. They wouldn't do it because it would mess up the calendar for three years. And, uh, he got to the next church and told the pastor, he said, that man, I fall dead in this pulpit two weeks from Sunday. Two weeks later, he fell over dead at this pulpit. Because he didn't want to admit he was wrong. He was teaching stuff about faith he had taught against and would not let correction come. And he'd rather die than admit he was wrong. Now, there are a lot of churches and denominations and people on this planet who would rather you be sick than them be wrong. God help us, because that's not the compassion in the heart of the Lord. That's not the desire of the Lord. He loves people. Can you say amen? I said he loves people. Hallelujah. And uh, he wants them well. He wants them healed. He wants them whole. He sent, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them. Amen. Hallelujah. Man born, I told you, I, you know, maybe I would get, I ain't gonna get here I go again. All right, well, let's let's take let's get the crippled woman healed. Okay, Luke thirteen. We're going to have to stop there. Luke ten. 
See, we're picking up stuff on the other side, on the, on the side roads over here while we're doing this. Y'all notice that? Yeah, I think a couple of them have been T-bone steaks. Luke 13, verse 10. If I told you Luke 10, I was wrong. Luke 13. Starting in verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Now listen to here. The Bible says she had a spirit of infirmity. <clears throat> so now we have a demon enforced sickness. She <coughs> She's not just sick because she picked up a virus floating around the air. This is a demonically enforced sickness. Um, and was bowed together. I'm sorry. Uh, which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. How long? 18. And was bowed together and could in no wise lift her up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called for her and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. What's the thing? He, whatever you bind on earth should be bound to heaven. Whatever you loose, he loosed her from the co uh, control of that demon spirit enforcing that infirmity on her. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. God's getting the glory. God's getting the praise. I mean, you probably got a Holy Ghost shout service going on. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. And them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath I mean, I got, like Emperor Palpatine, you evil, Star Wars, okay? And Jesus answered, Jesus didn't put up with it for a second. Jesus answered and said, thou hypocrite, doth not each of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, stop, who is she? She's a what? She's a covenant woman. And who is, who is God? Jehovah Rapha. I am the covenant God that is your physician. She, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, being a covenant woman, have access to Jehovah Rapha's promises? Whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loose from the bond on this Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Hallelujah. It never, it never, it never ceases to amaze me that religious people get angry when God does something in someone's life that they've gone around and said he doesn't do anymore. Instead of going, I was wrong. Look at that. Oh my, thank you, Jesus. I rejoice with them. Thank God. I may I understand, but I can tell you what, they're healed. There they are. And they're giving praise to God Almighty. Hallelujah. Are you here? And it's, it, I, I just, I never cease to be amazed at that kind of thinking. And the only explanation, the only explanation is that they are operating under demonic control of their mind. Because a pure heart 
and a heart after God will rejoice if when God does something that way to minister to somebody and would I turn everything on silent I turn off the alarm and that thing still goes off um, if you really had compassion and a heart for people you would be rejoicing for people who got healed can you be imagining being mad that somebody got healed of cancer because your church don't believe in healing? Well, that's, we don't believe in that. That's of the devil. You know? It's about like this, this Waynesboro, whatever it is, Baptist church that goes around and protests the soldiers and all this stuff, and God hates fags, and God hates queers, and, you know, um, and our military's out there fighting and they're out there protesting them and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. They're not of the spirit of God. Well, doesn't God hate fags and queers? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves them, sent Jesus to bring a delivering power to them to set them free from their captivity. He wants to deliver them, not hate them. Hello. These people are of the, they're the ones that are of the devil. They got a religious spirit. They're a cult. How do you know? By this shall all men know you're my disciples, that ye have love one for another. Hello? They hate with venomous hate. Now, do I like the lifestyle? Absolutely not. It's an abomination to God. The, the lifestyle is an abomination. But it's demonically inspired, and God sent Jesus to deliver. So he's made deliverance available because he loves them. And because people fight for our country and we have passed laws that, that said that you know, certain lifestyles are now legal, um, then he, he, they hate every soldier that dies. You are warped. Makes me think of Mr. Tuttle from the Gospel Bill show. Warped man, warped man, warped man. Shannon, you remember that? Yeah. He's a warped man, warped man, warped man. Some of y'all didn't get to see Mr. Gospel Bill shows. They're great. Yeah, they're, you know, Willie George, that was part of his children's ministry. He even had Camp Dry Gulch. And the shame is, because his lawsuits are said they had to shut down that camp because they couldn't afford the insurance to keep it open. People suing over, you know, stuff happening, and stuff, kids getting hurt and that kind of stuff. They ended up having to shut it down. All the good that camp did and all the kids that got ministered to. But it's the devil. Stirred people up, you know. I'm glad all my kids got to go before they got before that happened. Yep. They grew up on Willie George stuff. They really did. Hallelujah. So anyway. Um, but again, how many times have we talked Mike, tonight? They got mad because somebody got healed. Three, three things we talked about tonight. The, the religious folks are mad. So here we go. When you start going out and ministering to people like you're supposed to, Like you're supposed to. Y'all did get that dig, didn't you? You're going to make people mad. You might lose friends. You might become one of them. I got to ask you a question. Would you be rather, one of, rather be one of them and see people healed and set free than to be or be accepted by the people who don't believe in anything. That's a question. Because your popularity with friends is not more important than carrying out the Great Commission from the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. So be prepared for the persecution. Be prepared for the be prepared for the naysayers. Be prepared for the ones that all of a sudden you're not invited anymore. Hello, because you're one of them. Oh, yeah. Maybe one of them, one of them tongue-talking. 
they, they lay hands on people. And my wife has a co-worker. There, there's something happened with their, their um, child. And she, she was talk, texting Janie, very upset. Their blood sugar was unmeasurable. It was so high. And um, they were on their way to the hospital. They said they were immediately transferring the child to uh, a hospital. And um, I said, ask them if you can call them. And they're, they're Christians. We know they're Christians. We don't know how much they believe like us, but they're Christians. Got them on the phone, and um, Janie said, we're here. And I said, so-and-so, because I know it, it's a co-worker at the same place. I said, we're praying. And first of all, I'm going to say, I declare your faith will not fail you. And then we prayed. Prayed for the power of God to work. Prayed that they'll be strengthened in the inner man with might. Hallelujah. That they'll be able to walk through this with great strength and power. And that he's healed from the top of his head to the soles of their feet. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And prayed like I would pray if they were standing right here in church laying hands on them. And they're crying on the other end. Because the husband and the wife are in the car together. Amen. You get, I, I said, I said, I don't want you to text her. I said, I want to pray. I want them, I said her, let it out. Her, I want her to hear words of faith. Yes. Yes. Amen. I want to hear words of authority. Not just in a text. I want them to hear it. Yes. Amen. And I told them that they're, they, they, have, they have strength and might in the inner man. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. One of the things I've started praying for people in certain is their faith will not fail them. That faith fail thee not. Amen. Because they gotta, you got to have faith to walk through the storms. Amen. Amen. And, um, you know, um, where, there we are. Let me see if I can find this. Jesus, talking to Peter, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail, be, fail not. That thy faith fail not. Amen? We've got, we've got to carry power. And people need to hear us proclaim words of faith and words of authority and words of power. Amen? Glory to God. So that they, um, it is something that will resonate in their spirit and stay with them long after you spoke it to them. Yes. You can still hear it. text messages. Okay, I get it. I mean, we, and sometimes that's what we have to do because it's the most, it is the most advantageous at the moment. But I am telling you, if you've got the opportunity to pray and speak words of faith and speak in authority, do it because it will. Why? Words have power. Words are carriers. They carry the anointing. But speak the word only. Amen? It carries authority. It carries power. Glory to God. And we got to be more bold about it. Because it will resonate with people. Amen? Amen? I said it will resonate with people. The Holy Spirit will just keep bringing that up to them. Your faith won't fail you. You heard what Pastor Taylor said. Your faith's not going to fail you. You're strong for the battle because your faith won't fail you. Let me tell you how powerful words are. When, when Karen was in the hospital, I guess now... Well, we were not, we were not, we were out of the business park. We were in the um, community center. Um, <clears throat> and had the wreck. And, you know, six inches from being cut in half. I mean, she was very close to being just dead on the site. And um, in the hospital, they were still saying they're going to have to amputate her legs, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that she has her legs is a miracle. Just the fact that she's even able to get up out of a chair and, and walk with the, uh, with the um, 
is a major, major, major miracle. And um, we, called, we called her husband and, and said, can we come visit? Because they weren't in the church anymore. Yes, please. And so I got there um, and we got to the room and walked in. She's laying there, boop, 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 respirator, I, face is swollen. She's swollen. She's in a, a ba basically like a, a chemical-induced coma because of the pain. The pain level would be too, too extreme to withstand. I mean, it just it sh just stripped the meat off her legs. They had to take muscle and cut it in half and bend it and do skin grafts. I mean, it was just going on and on and on and on. But I walk over to the bed. She's, I mean, she's out. You just look, you're looking at something going, I leaned there and I said, Karen, this is pastor. Her arms started flailing. Her spirit hurts. And I started praying faith over her and speaking faith over her. Okay? I, I, I was just like, <clears throat> don't tell me we're bodies. Her spirit, I mean, she just, because she was, she's out. People are moving all around in the room, you know, the, and here, I just say, this is pastor. Oh, yeah. She knew I was in the room. And we were able to speak faith. And then God would give us more. Uh, Kathy was up there with her all the time, her sister. And I, and I told Kathy, I, I said, you tell Karen that pastor said you're healed. This is after she's awake now. And there'll be no setbacks. I say, I got word from the Lord. Words, no setbacks. She didn't have any setbacks. There were times they were trying to say she was going to have a setback. And they were going to have to go ahead and cut the legs off or whatever. Uh-uh. She just kept progressing and progressing and progressing. Amen. I said, amen. We have to. I've done that with people who were dying. Sister Herndon. Now, I, I did everything I could to get that woman to get into faith, and she would just say, yeah, Pastor, I, I, one of these days. No, Sister Herndon, it's got to be right now. Yeah, I know, Pastor, one of these days. I couldn't, I couldn't get her. And, she, and then she'd get joking. You know, she was an African-American lady, and she, she would just stop and look at me and say, you know, my husband is white as you are. Yes, yeah, sister, and you told me that before. And, <coughs> and uh, she wouldn't let me come see her unless she could get her wig on. I couldn't go see her without a wig. She had to, she had to, look, she had to look nice. Yeah. Pastor couldn't come without her wig. And, um, and so, you know, she's up there, and she's kind of, she's gone into a coma. She's, she was a severe diabetic. And I just couldn't get her, get her over to here. And... Um, I had all the kids in the room with her. And um, now I'm just about the spirit, soul, and body right now. I don't, I'm just over here. So I just, and um, they all said they agreed it's time to let her go. You know, they, they just didn't want to, but they, they know, you know, it was time to let her go. Suddenly there, I said, Sister Herndon, this is Pastor. I said, now, Stephanie's in here, Doug's in here. Um, oh, Teresa, what, what's her old, the oldest daughter? Deborah. I said, they're all here and they all agree that it's time to let you go. So, Sister Hern, I, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to tell you, go ahead, throw caution to the wind, and go on home in the name of Jesus. It won't be any, um, anything against your faith. You'll love the Lord. You'll go home. We'll see you on the other side. I looked at the guy and said, okay. I walked out of the room. I walked five steps down the hallway. And the youngest came running down the hall. Pastor Ed, Pastor Ed, Pastor Ed. She's gone. Wow. She went out. Blessed. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Glory to God. I know she hurt. She had to hear me. I said, it's okay to go. Go. And then she leaves. Karen heard my voice. She knew it was me in the room with her. 
And I spoke words of faith. Sister Herndon, with, with, no matter what I did, I could not get that woman into the right, into now. I couldn't do it. I tried. I mean, I tried. You know? But she just, she was happy where she was. And apparently happy and ready to go. So, okay. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, let's receive the offering. Anybody need, got a, need a, anybody got in-house offering tonight? Okay. If you're watching on the internet, go ahead and send it, uh, pay, PayPal or uh, Cash App. In the name of Jesus, we bless you and thank God that you're giving according to the Word of God. Heaven's windows are open and empty out upon you down in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right. Remember these words of 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. What Sarah is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. See you next time here, Expedition Church of the Triad. Until then, be blessed.